All we truly have left from the past are memories, kept through the content that we share. Many details in history are debated even among the experts because they weren't there. All statements made during this podcast will reflect my opinion based on my research, knowledge, and experience. Please do not use any of this content in academia, journalistic publication, or to make investments. Philosophy Digestion is produced on ACAST Independent Podcast Network. Viewer discretion advised. Yo, 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 giddy, yo. What's good and welcome to the very first episode of Philosophy Digestion, where we digest and regurgitate ideas from classic pieces of philosophy recorded in my native tongue, West Coast American English. And our roast of these philosophers will be served with a sense of humor as we focus on their iconic think pieces, their science and non-science manifestos. My name is John Gavin, and I am stoked to welcome you to Philosophy Digestion. We're going to look for some dead bodies that these prestigious icons kept laying in their back crick. We're going to digest their philosophy and take an educated dump, excreting all the bullshit these pretentious icons actually brung to society, and hopefully we'll learn something. But be warned, philosophy's It's fun, but it can actually be super toxic in heavy doses. And uh, if you don't believe me, just find a first-year philosophy major and check in with them. Ask them if they're doing okay, because I know I wasn't. You can join us for new episodes here on Thursdays, wherever you like to listen. Our regurgitation will be funnier and more interesting than the mainstream prestigious take that you're going to get on philosophers in the academy or from some old documentary. And we're going to flush the unnecessary BS. Don't worry. Today, I'm going to take a little bit of time to chat about how you and I can have fun and be wise people at the same time by learning about philosophy. I, frankly, hate the university system's expectation for you and me and everyone to use and adhere to an elitist language and speak until most people are just confused to to prove that you're right and prove that you're smart. That might just be enough to really propel your point of view into the point of view of those around you. Our subject today, Simone, only had her ideas really heard because she was a wealthy white French person and she was a woman and it took an incredible amount of prestige for people to listen to a woman in the 1940s. That and her boyfriend was rich and famous and also a philosopher. So she was well poised to have her ideas heard. And that doesn't mean that other women of the time weren't having the same ideas and weren't just as smart as Simone. I have a degree in philosophy, and there are definitely smarter folks than me that don't. And if I mention a prestigious name like Simone de Beauvoir or Socrates, oof. (laughs) A lot of people can't actually smell the bullshit. It's like you can buy the language to win an argument, and that's not okay. You don't have to be a hoity-toity expert, PhD biologist, philosopher hero, or anything like that to keep up with the conversation, because the quality of the ideas that universities support heavily affect us through our fellow voters and donors and alumni. You, no matter who you are, If you haven't taken a philosophy class before and this is brand new, you're invited to participate in the conversation about ideology and justice. It doesn't matter what your level of education is because you perceive just as much of the real world as the rest of us. If you know about the topics that the hoity-toity use as their starting points, though, like Simone de Beauvoir and Socrates, You'll be one huge leg of the race with them, leg up in the race of 
it's all BS too, because it's not even a race that you want to win. I can exercise without racing. And I'm here to share that mentality with you. You don't have to be a doctor to understand why smoking is bad for you. Non-doctors know lots of stuff like first aid and nutrition, enough to be prepared for critical injuries after a car crash or plan a healthy breakfast. It's the same with philosophy and literature and these hoity-toity subjects. You don't have to ponder each moment and read into every blue curtain and be known as smarter than everyone else in your life. In order to use wisdom and stories from the past to help understand the truth or your day-to-day life in a different light. Philosophy is usually boring because the people that have a monopoly on the production of philosophy content are at the top of higher education. And there's something to be said about how systems perpetuate patterns. But that is probably for a later episode. Bottom line is, you're not dumb because you can't tell me about any ancient philosophers. But if you listen to this podcast enough, you will be able to tell somebody about ancient philosophers. And for me, that feels like a performative accomplishment. It's boring and it's expensive to gain credibility in narrow fields of study but it can be super helpful to have a broad overview and a conversational understanding of topics that society values because philosophy is helpful when a philosophical emergency comes up you know before your coffee or for the human race you have an existential crisis you can turn to the ideas and the concepts of the great philosophers, those who lived it first, wrote it down, and other people were like, this is very helpful, thank you. And so history kept it for us to use today. We don't support extreme dieting here on philosophy digestion or cults, especially when it comes to philosophy. These are tools for realms of thought. And I think that's about all I have to spew on the, my underlying suppositions for this podcast. Sorry, I think suppositions is a douchey word. Let's move on to today's topic. She has a whole story hidden from philosophy classrooms and PBS documentaries. Our topic, a founder of white feminism, Simone de Foubois. It turns out has a lot of corpses in her crick. By the end of this, I hope you're able to taste transcendence. And we're also going to touch on her ugly, saggy, troll boyfriend, John Paul Sard. The New York Times in 1996, in an article by Alan Writing, says, By their own accounts, Sart and Beauvoir were selfish, callous, and cruel not least to the third parties caught in their web. They're two evil people with acclaimed philosophical reputations. Start brewing some tea now and get ready for an especially heinous episode. So Simone de Vubois was born in 1908 and she was raised in a super sexist and Catholic home. She became a feminist and an atheist in her early teens which was super fringe back then. This, so this is, you know, she was born in 1908, so she's 12 in 1920. So mid-1920s, she's the girl who doesn't believe in God and would probably be accused of witchcraft just a few decades earlier. Her full name is Simone Lucy Ernestine Marie Bertrand de Beauvoir, And she is a Daenerys type uh, with the long name and whatnot, but also, you know, like Walter White, definitely the smartest one in the room with an entitled victim complex. Like I like the kind of idea that like I've been shit on and things are hard for me because of society. So I'm going to be horrible to other people and that's okay. 
You know, her idea from the beginning is it's my world. Why the fuck are you ruling it? So she was young and dumb in the roaring 20s. Simone's like, I'm 21. I'm hot. I'm rich. I'm going to go to Paris and fall in love. And at the University of Paris, she meets the other half of her fucked up coin, 24-year-old future internationally renowned philosopher, John Paul Sartre. Sartre is a total creep. Around this time when he was younger, he showed up to school dances naked and with hookers. And he was very um, controlling and possessive over the girls that he had feelings for. So Sartre is head over heels in love with Simone because basically they have an open relationship. And he's like getting laid all the time because he's a philosopher and he's rich. And he proposes to Simone supposedly no less than four times. And true story, that was how their relationship... So that was around 1929. And 1929 through 1943. So what is that? 11, 14 years? Beauvoir taught at the Lycee level until she could support herself on her earnings as a writer and a philosopher. She taught at Lycée Montegrand, Lycée Jeanine d'Arc, and Lycée Molière. And if I said any of those wrong, I'm really sorry, especially with how pretentious I said them. So those are all secondary schools in France. And a secondary school uh, has children, and for Simone, it, they were girls-only schools, so it's kids aged 11 to 18. And during her time at these schools, she was adored, a real female role model who seemed to be showing young women at the time, when women had it rough, that they could be smart and educated leaders. The Irish Times was eventually shocked enough to ask Simone de Foubois as a role model? Because while Simone taught 11 to 18 year olds, she would gain their trust, dangle opportunity and prestige in front of these little girls and invite them over for dinner and drinks so that she and her ugly boyfriend, John, could sexually abuse them and begin an emotional manipulation until Simone and Sartre died in the 1980s. And Simone said in her own words that Sartre didn't like little girls. He liked d dominating their bodies, which those are the words that she used. And that, uh, and she was famously jealous of her boyfriend John's constant sexual conquests because she loved him. And she said she was bisexual, so also definitely attracted to girls. So maybe she was, like, double jealous in... Well, she actually explains her sort of sick double jealousy in one of her books, and I will get to that later. For Sartre, who was literally a lazy-eyed, face-sagging, troll-looking narcissist who definitely had a weird penis. Google him, look at his face, tell me he didn't have a weird penis. Here's a quote from the Daily Mail. During the first years, Sartre embarked on the arrangement with Gusto. He liked to sleep with virgins, after which he rapidly lost interest. They left the highly zexed Simone, now teaching philosophy, constantly frustrated, despite the young lovers she took. Once they had their leadership and prestige in the philosophy world... And though she was removed from her teaching position eventually, she only really received slaps on the wrist. So 1943, Simone writes a novel called She Came to Stay about these abusive relationships. And I know it's literally a signed confession, right? Simone's novel, her signed confession, She Came to Stay, is one where she tells a story of seducing a secondary high school student who represents for sure two real girls who were sisters and probably others. And the characters this they were loosely based on were 14 and 15, around when they started being groomed. And in the novels, the famous philosopher Simone de Beauvoir wrote that it was these young girls 
who are unspeakably manipulative, and it is she, the adult woman, who is suffering and the victim. While Olga would later, in real life, say that those relationships damaged her psychologically and it affected her life and her self-image. But in the abuser's published, societally read novel about the ordeal, Olga's character is painted as the aggressor and the villain who comes between Simone and her partner. And the people that, you know, raved about the book and supported Simone totally ignored the devastation and the violation and the gaslighting that this young girl suffered. If you are interested in advertising on this podcast, you can email management at humorus.net. That's M-A-N-A-G-M-E-N-T at humorus.net. The real Olga was groomed from the age of 15. She studied closely with Sartre and Beauvoir through school and into adulthood. She passed her university with best, but they exploited and maintained her with control over how society viewed their story. According to the Daily Mail, one of their victims took to self-harming, another committed suicide. Most remained unfulfilled with their influence, still looming, dependent on Simone, who perversely referred to them as her family. They never escaped total control because of how powerful these psychopaths were. The novel that she wrote, She Came to Stay, in context, really goes to show how much influence over somebody's career, public image, can have, and how that influence can be exhaustive. And honestly, like, props to our girl Olga and all their victims for the strength it must have taken to live every day under those gaslighting ideas. As we're about to discuss, Simone increased the quality of women's rights internationally because her content, it was palatable and mass-produced, even to those men with prestige, wealth, and power, because her ideas on women's liberation echoed the struggles that all women face. But she also used her voice and her power to abuse and to represent for the pedophile community. We're about to do a dive into the rest of work that followed She Came to Stay that Simone is, I feel like, actually remembered for. But I can't forget the heinous crimes that she's committed, and I don't want you to either. And I would encourage you to... Fuck. The entire truth should be considered when reflecting on the past. So, John Paul Sartre, her boyfriend, I'm going to cover him briefly. He had a lot of ideas about subjects and objects, and I'm sure that you've heard the word objectification. But then, in her own independent work, she runs with the key takeaways from Sartre that he says you're responsible for taking agency with your own life. It sucks to be an object to somebody else's desires. And you are responsible for seeing yourself as a subject in your own damn sentence. Which is easy to say when you're a rich white guy who's allowed to get away with whatever he wants, like bringing hookers to prom. He says, though, that there's nothing we are actually born into except the physical world around us and then the social reality that other people tell us. Don't be an object in somebody else's sentence. And while continuing to abuse young girls and advocating for pedophilia and not facing the consequences of their actions, Simone publishes a number of works along the titles of All Men Are Mortal, Who Shall Die, and The Blood of Others. Then, in 1947, Simone de Beauvoir publishes The Ethics of Ambiguity. 
her self-proclaimed masterpiece, and it is an OG existentialism classic. And if you don't know what existentialism is, that is okay. It's one of the branches of philosophy. It's a view on reality and spirituality and religion. And people that hold existential views believe that we simply are right now. They even question the moments leading up to this moment. And they say we have all come to this world from nothing of any meaning. And because there is not a purpose or a pre-existing meaning, we have the ultimate freedom to decide what is happening right now and the purpose of it all. And that's the beauty of humanity. And a lot of existentialists talk about what's inside the human mind, our spirit, as infinite and alpha and omega, and the creator of meaning and the intuitor of justice. They talk about the human mind and soul as though it is God, and the connection between us as though it makes God stronger. Existentialists might say they don't believe in God, but they talk about life and consequences. Sorry, life and con... I struggle saying the word consciousness. So existentialists talk about life and consciousness a lot. And in my opinion, being raised Catholic, they talk about it a lot like the Roman Catholic Bible talks about God. And in this super long book, The Ethics of Ambiguity, she says that you have the facticity to think of yourself and others as subjective meaning creators that live lives manifested because of the will of the spirit, unaltered and uninhibited by, I don't know, what inhibits the spirit? She says, and this is an exact quote, we are constrained by physical limits, social barriers, and the expectations and political power of others. So in this book, she plays Freud for a really good portion of it, and she spends a long time, in my opinion, over-explaining in great detail that we learn about right and wrong and society from our experiences. And our experiences are perceived with a lens from the experiences that came first. And so our first experiences are super important because they're what your point of view for all of the rest of your life is based on. And she also kind of shits on nihilism and she says that it's dumb and pointless and she thinks that being happy and free is something that you do in spite of the lack of meaning that is given to you. And she says people are meant to be free to do their thing, and that humans are meant to make themselves free. Like in Spirit, the horse movie, Stallion of the Cimarron. If you haven't seen it, this isn't an ad, I swear. Spirit, Spirit Stallion of the Cimarron, it's about a horse, it's amazing. And then after she's done rehashing Spirit, she argues with Karl Marx, who is Mr. Communism himself, about why we do things. She thinks that it's for projects and fame. And Karl Marx thinks that it's for labor and expensive stuff. And as of this recording the pod of this podcast, the jury's out on that one, and I didn't do a great job summing it up. We'll probably talk more about this specific point when we cover communism. But Bawar sums up her views on human freedom with another real true quote. She says, we are absolutely free today if we choose to will our existence in its finiteness, a finiteness which is open to the infinite. And she ends with a call for us all to realize on a fundamental truth of our existence, whatever that is inside you that's unique to you and independent of society. According to Anya Steinbeier, Simone argues that others, others judge us and impose limits on us to the unbearable degree that hell is other people.
But Brevoir also says that while this may not be a problem without other people, you will be limited in manifesting who you truly are without being able to build relationships and exist with other people. Because it's your experiences together that shape who you become. And being who you are in that social, physical transition with others through time is invaluable to the human experience. That was a little hoity-toity. I apologize. I hope you pick up what I'm putting down, though. If you remember anything I tell you today, it's this. Her idea of transcendence. You can understand as taking a moment or a, or a lifetime. And your spirit sheds entirely of all the bullshit that the outside world puts onto you, including the fact that other people see your body, that they judge you at all, and prejudge your spirit and who you are based on what they see and how you have existed in the real physical world. They even assume what your genitalia looks like. It's just light and sound refracting off of you onto them, and it's horseshit and you exist independent of everybody's judgment. So I want you, my friend, to take a deep breath. We're gonna take 30 seconds, I'll put on a little uh, vibe in music, and I want you to just let go of whatever everyone else has put onto you and feel your spirit and try to find what that magic inside you is, despite the world around you. And after transcending, who are you? Who are you? Simone thinks that you should be manifesting that spirit every day in your life. But she writes that women can't do that at all, especially in the 1940s, because they're too busy carrying a suitcase of every tiny man's idea of what a woman should be. And that's how every woman lives, or she's not going to fit in, having to carry that suitcase around, have the hair, wear the shoes, be the submissive, kind woman that every man expects her to be. And Simone says that you need others to manifest your transcendence and to recognize you as who you are, because you can't do it on an island alone. Unless that is your whole spirit's thing, then go and be on an island alone, live your dream. But she authors her ideas and really represents the oppression that women and white women in France face in a book called The Second Sex, which she publishes in 1949. She's like, oh, okay, so to transcend, you have to be hyper-confident, entitled to be you, allowed to be heard, outgoing since you're not going to fit in, but you still want to go to parties, and if some asshole just assumes that I've got a vagina based on the light refracting off of me and into his eyes, he's not going to let any of that behavior fly, now is he? My prospects and my employers will be limited by my truth. You know, she's all worried. Oh, wow. I told myself I wasn't going to do voices in this podcast. But there that was. <laughs> by the way, she says that all the products that she buys are gendered. What's up with that? And she's definitely going to be getting sass if she wears, God forbid, men's boots or men's pants. You know, a woman in slacks in the office, that's just inappropriate, says society in the 1940s. 
where Sark, her boyfriend, is basically just kind of sitting in a corner like, <clears throat> we're all just here making meaning, and we decide what's an object. Literally, for a thousand years, cave people thought that lions and the moon were subjects. People with intention and will. Just as those people are subjects, anti-Nazi Americans aren't necessarily subjects. They're objects. And not necessarily good people. So think about that, he says as a Nazi sympathizer. So everyone at this time around World War II is adhering to the narrative, hey, you have a vagina, why don't you have a family? I think it would just be great if you had a family, really give me something meaningful that I can imagine you doing with your time, not being a man and all. And if you live in that world, then that's a very easy track to fall into. And if that's not you as a woman, then that's a barrier to you manifesting your spirit and transcending if other people aren't going to let you get off the track. Let's put the, let's take this out of 1940s France and put it into kind of our personal lives. If you think of somebody as a subject, then you let them have their own opinions and you let them do what they want and you appreciate them for mere existing, for the life and the creativity that they bring. You know, you want them to be like the moon or a lion, just fucking there and proud, and you don't expect them to behave a certain way for you. And if everybody's living their life like that, you're really only going to conflict if you have interests or goals that are misaligned. But think about the people in your life. Do you expect them to sit, fit or sit in a certain role? or behavior, because it's going to make you happy? Or do you feel like you have to live up to somebody else's expectation, and that expectation isn't really who you want to be? And if anybody has to behave or become something they don't want to, to fit somebody else's life picture, to make them happy, they're just an object in that person's world. And... Simone says, now we're bringing it back to the 40s, every single woman has the picture of wivehood and motherhood thrust upon her, no matter who she is. And if you are a young woman and you aren't encouraged or taught to think or that you're able to think for yourself and have your own independent desires... Simone thinks that that's a lot like slavery, and she says to all you Americans listening out there, to really achieve freedom, you have to know exactly why you're doing what you do, and what the other tracks available to you are, to really be making a free person's choice. You're going to order that thing on Amazon? Eat the second family size box of Tostitos pizza rolls? Do you want to finish high school? Who are is whispering these challenges to you, and do you accept them? Why or why not? Do they fit into your life picture? I can now imagine that you're a woman who, in my state, Oregon, in the 1970s, was not allowed to have a checking account because she was married. And you know... What if she wants to get her second family-sized box of Tostitos pizza rolls, but her husband's just unavailable? It's not like she can just go out and get a high-salary job, you know, a Tostitos job, with career advancement opportunities that makes her feel fulfilled, unless she wants to give up her slacks, conform to everybody else's ideas of what being a professional woman is. And if she can't get pizza rolls, what else can't she get? Like, if your significant other isn't able to get their pizza rolls because you control the checking account, you might be limiting and objectifying your person. But also, they may have a Tostitos problem, and you may be supporting them. I'm not trying to judge. 
But I do think we should all be mindful of when we're supporting someone and when we are dominating or domineering over them. Simone doesn't say, but she basically says that if you're painting your own life picture, you get to decide what the setting looks like, who's in the picture, what the color scheme is, and you're not going to be able to do that if you accept the painting of a wife and mother that is thrust upon all women. And conforming to somebody else's painting sucks. To be a mother to another person's portrait or just a wife to a husband's family picture is it sucks and it feels empty and it's the identity that women have been forced into and are still expected to adhere to and Simone gives some examples in some short stories in a book called The Women Destroyed she wrote this book in 1967 so a bit later and in this book there's a sort of reckoning that women have to do with the differences between sort of where they wanted to end up and where the tracks they're on have led them. And even now, when they accept their choices and they try to move off the track and become who they want to be, the people around them, their family, their husbands, their children, they want them to be those picture-perfect mothers and those wives. And escaping that is painful and change is hard. And it's especially hard when the people around them don't let them manifest their true spirits. This book is important because it helped people understand why some ladies don't want to be house mothers. And it showed some young girls that it's okay to want the life that you want. And it showed women that are struggling as mothers that it's totally understandable and that there's a lot on your plate. But there are also plenty of good feminists books out there who are not authored by rich white pedophiles. But for some reason, Simone de Beauvoir is sort of a staple in American philosophy classrooms. And then in 1977, her and John Paul Sartre and a group of other people, those two, Simone and Sartre, along with a ring of philosophers and pedophiles in France, all got together and signed a petition to decriminalize sex between adults and minors below the age of 15. And most sources that I visited don't talk about how Simone de Beauvoir signed this petition, was an advocate for, I don't even know, pedophilia, uh, and all the horrible things that I already went over and kind of don't want to go over again. Simone and John were both dead by the 1990s. And Simone's ideas of feminism had a big influence on the women's rights movement and the discussion around feminism today in our classrooms and in our streets. She's also an OG existentialist, which is basically what our society is shifting into, in my opinion. You know, things like the Matrix and the Metaverse. Being aware of rabbit hole extreme Facebook and Twitter threads and understanding that the realities other people create affect you. And asking yourself, do you have control over it? And I think a real challenge is asking ourselves, how much control over other people's realities do we have? And I know that was a little uh, abstract and kind of off topic, but I think that that's a big idea that we'll be exploring more as we go through this podcast together. And I think that my point is that the people who understand power best and that these ideas come from. I don't know. They really have to understand power dynamics. And for some reason, Simone seems like someone who was both a victim and a perpetrator of power being abused, if that sentence was grammatically correct. I guess if you want to study things, society passes down, like surgery and philosophy. The sad news is that the privileged people in power historically have had the privilege to abuse that power and harm others. You know, the people famous and influential enough to popularize new content, they usually had enough prestige to get away with whatever they wanted. And I'm not an expert on pop culture, but I think that that's something we see a lot 
today. Honest to God, I studied Simone in class myself a few times, and there was always like a blurb about how she was had a scandalous relationship with John Paul Sartre and other women. But they never talked about how those weren't women. I'd actually given a copy of one of Simone's books to my mom. It's not that I believe in censorship or anything, but I definitely didn't want to give my mom a book written by a pedophile. Let us know what your thoughts are on separating the art from the artist and the value of talking about people like Simone de Beauvoir. I like to think that this podcast today, even though it was about someone heinous, was valuable because it's shedding a light on this person that is not usually seen. And today, if you're looking for one small thing you can do to help shed some light on somebody else, in a good way, uh, you can lift your fingers to rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast, because positive energy like that is created and reciprocal, and it's that kind of stuff that really helps out uh, small teams like ours. I hope that you are able to transcend all of the bullshit in your life today and every day. Until next time, my name's John Gavin. Today's sources include a Philosophy Now article by Anya Steinbauer, a YouTube video by Book Whimsy, an article called The Odd Couple by The New York Times, the podcast Philosophize This, which you should check out, separate lectures by Dr. Gregory Sadler and Dr. Albert Spencer, Alcatron.com and their article on Simone de Beauvoir, The Law and Philosophy of Jean-Paul Sartre by Enya Narita, an article by the Daily Mail by Glennis Roberts, the work of Simone de Beauvoir herself, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy's article on Simone de Beauvoir, and of course, Wikipedia. Special thanks to our music provider, Pixabay. Check them out for royalty-free music. Until next time, 